and attention. So today I didn't finish uh, last Wednesday's lecture. Just to remind you, when we talk about attention, intentional selection, Oh, by the way, yesterday I, gave, I had this great experience. I gave a talk at the senior curriculum, a senior college, downtown Pasadena. There's a senior college for people who are retired and you know, they offer scientific classes. And so I gave a talk there. It was very full. with like 100 people there. And the uh, gorilla in our midst worked beautiful. Like 10 people saw it. Uh, 10 people saw it and you know, all, everybody else didn't. And it, uh, it really worked very well. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a somewhat more, in, uh, in general, more, you know, um, uh, attention does get impaired with, uh, with, with age. Um, but even here there were a number of you who didn't see that. Right, remember the gorilla? Um, so, uh, I mean, just to summarize, there are two forms of attention selection, very crudely s uh, speaking. And they are, uh, you can think of them as bottom-up attention and top-down uh, attention selection. So these are ways how our brain voluntarily or involuntarily automatically selects relevant information from the mass of information out there and presents them to you, I mean to the conscious you. So what, the bottom up one exists all the, operates all the time, it's present all the time, it's automatic, you can't really, you can willfully ignore it, but it, you have to do it willfully, it comes at a price. Um, it's usually rapidly, it doesn't depend on the particular task, am I just looking around, am I looking for my friend, am I looking for an L among T's? Salience is, um, is, um, is, always, uh, is always present and does not guarantee access to, to conscious awareness. Then there's top-down attention, which is much, much more powerful. You can attend to essentially anything, but it, it, it requires voluntary effort. As we all know from trying to concentrate when we work, you know, if you do it for a long time, it, it's, actually, you know, it's, it's, it's actually somewhat exhausting. It can be spatially prescribed, so it can be like a searchlight of attention. That's a metaphor that's being used often. It can be directed to location in space as a searchlight. It can be focused at an entire object, or it can be uh, focused at specific attributes, like you can attend to everything red in the visual scene. Then sort of, as it were, red becomes salient everywhere in the, in the, in the scene. Uh, it takes longer, it's sustained, but it also takes longer to, to set in. Uh, it depends on the task. It is under a visual, volitional control, and it seems to guarantee access to consciousness. In other words, what you voluntarily attend to so you seem to be, uh, you, you're, you're conscious of. I don't know a case where, where you have that dissociation. Maybe it exists, I just don't know it. Now, you can ask the question, what can you see outside of focal attention? So for some people, as I mentioned, for some people that's a nonsensical question to ask because by definition, people say whatever you're conscious of, you have to tend to, sort of axiomatic. But at least you can say, okay, so let's, let's get away from that sterile debate because this, of course, revolves around what exactly do I define attention. And if I just do it by words or by, you know, if, if I confuse, if I say everything that you're conscious of, you attend, that seems to conflate two separate terms. And so ultimately we need a neuronal definition, which we don't have. So let's use an operational one. Let's say we'll do this dual task paradigm, and I'll t tell you how we do it. We'll get you to attend to one location in, in the part of the visual field, and we get you to really pay attention there, and we can tell when you're not attending because then your performance will drop. And then we can ask, what can you see outside the focus of attention? Now, already your in introspection seems to, t seems to suggest to you, I think correctly, that, you know, I can really attend to the tip of my finger here, can really, really focus on that, you know, the detailed structure of my fingernail, and it's, it's clearly, the, the, it's not that I have tunnel vision, right? You know, I could imagine that if I really attend, everything else sort of fades. That's not the case. There are some, there are some deficits, some neurological patients where they have something like that. It's called the balance syndrome. We'll talk about it a bit later. So balance syndrome, essentially one of, the, one of the symptoms is, there are a number of different symptoms. One of the symptoms is that you really only are aware of things at your focus of attention, where, where, where you attend to, and everything else you're literally not really aware of. So that's sort of a bit more like tunnel vision. But certainly normal, I mean, neurological intact individuals don't have this. Okay, now the dual task paradigm is sort of, I'm talking about here something that was perfected by Achim Braun, who's a professor now at Plymouth, he did this here at, at Caltech. You essentially ask people to do a demanding task, and I'll show it to you in a second. A task at the center of the display. So when you're looking at, you're looking at the center of the display, and I very briefly, let's see, 100 or 150 milliseconds, so it's a difficult task, I flash up five letters. And the letters can be either all the same, five L's or five T's, or they can be four T's and one L, or four L and one T, and then they're different. So like often in psychology, it's a two alternative first choice task. You have to say same or different, just two answers. You can guess, if you don't know, you should guess. So random performance is, is chance, is 50%. And 
and um, it's titrated with a mask. We'll talk about that in a second. So you can, so um, if you if you have less time, for example, if you quickly look away, you, you're totally unable to do this task. You really have to dedicate you, all your resources. And it's so tightly regulated that even if I give you 10 milliseconds less, it's already a very difficult task. 10 milliseconds less, you, there's a measurable decrement in performance. Now, at the same time, I flash up something in the periphery. Okay, and for example, what I can flash up is a, is a picture. I can, for example, flash up a letter, an L versus a T, or I can flash up a bar. And, and I can ask you, um, is a bar, let's say, horizontal or is it vertical? And so now there, this is always a display. The display is always at the center. You have these five letters. And then in the surround, in the periphery, not always at the same location to avoid eye movements, but sort of randomly on a circle, I flash up this, uh, this other test that I want to test. For example, for the sake of argument, let's say it's an L versus T. So the typical display will look like this, that at the center you have sort of, let's see, uh, they can be rotated. So this would be, here the answer would be different because the foils and one T's. And then somewhere in a circle, you know, four, I think it was four degrees eccentricity, let's say I put a single L or a single T. And now I'm asking you to do three different things. Well, I'm asking in three different configurations, sorry. In configuration one, I'll say, forget about the surround, just concentrate on the central task, and I'm going to perform, just, just tell me the central task performance. So here I plot the percent performance of the center task, so this is central performance. 50% is chance, and 100% is perfect. So let's see, and I titrate things with a mass so that you do, let's see, on average, 85% correct. Okay, second trial, and in a, in, I intermix these trials. Second trials, I say, well, forget about the center. I want you to look at the center. I really want you to look at the center, and I can track that with eye movements, with, you know, eye scanner. And I ask you, okay, just do this round, T versus L. Now, this looks, of course, sounds trivial, but A, this T can be any orientation, so it can look like this, or, you know, even upside down. Plus, it could be anywhere here, and it's very briefly presented. So it's not an easy task, but by itself, you can perfectly well do it. 50% is chance. 100% is perfect, so I arrange things that you do it, you know, I arrange things with a mask, I showed only very briefly, so you do, let's see, again, do on average 85% correct. Now, in the third condition, I ask you to do both things at once. I can ask you, okay, now tell me, so now it gets a little bit more difficult and you have to train subjects, because now they have to pull two, you know, they have to push two, uh, two sets of buttons, one for the central and the other one for the peripheral performance, that's more difficult, and you have to train people to do that. So you change their brain. And now you can ask the question, well, if both things are truly independent, let's see, if this uh, requires attention, if this one doesn't require attention, well, then the performance on average should be here, right? So here's a performance with one, the peripheral by itself, here's a performance central test by itself, I ask you to do both, then your, you know, your, 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 your performance will be over there. And if it's not, for example, let's say this one requires attention, well, then it depends exactly on what I tell you. And I usually, the, the subjects are usually instructed to, if they have a doubt, to first do this task and only then do this. So typically, when there's a performance, you, you, um, when there's attention interference, you get some of the performance along this diagonal. Okay, so that's the, that's the setup. So I'll think. Uh, sorry. So let's see. Okay, here the task is, is an animal or not in the scene? This was done actually in the lab by Fefe Lee and Rufin van Rullen. So you can see it's not altogether easy. Did any of you see that? Okay, so, but remember, you are supposed to, and I mean, of course, you are sitting at very different distances, but what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to look at the center, tell me whether there's else, whether they're all else or all T's that's same, or whether there are four else and one T or four T and one L that's different, and then also say that image that you, so you see brief image which is then mask, that image doesn't contain an animal or not. Let's just do that again. And of course, I can control the, you know, timing very well on this, you know, my Mac and the LCD. Do you have a feeling that you can do both? Uh, yeah, although it's pretty big from where you sit. Um, okay, I mean, it doesn't really matter. I mean, this is just illustrative, right? The, the timing is totally off with the LCD and the computer display. So, okay, so let me just tell you some of the results. So, for instance, if I, if I do this with L versus T in the periphery, you cannot do this. It's really quite remarkable. So, in other words, 
your, my intention is engaged here. There's an L on T here somewhere. Yeah, I can clearly see it. Uh, well, I can see something there. I know there's something there, right, on this empty background. But I can't really tell whether what, what uh, I mean, what, what the letter is, whether it's L versus T, which is really very remarkable. Uh, on the other hand, this you can do. This, surprise, and this is to, to everybody's surprise, this task, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to show, I mean, I'll just draw the data out on the, on the, on the, so you can do simple things, like you can say whether it has a particular color or if there's a big, if, if there's an orientation in the periphery that's different from neighboring orientation, but L versus T you can do. What you can do, you can say whether a scene contains an animal or no animal or whether the scene contains a, a means of transportation, a car or bus or a truck or a plane, or no means of transportation. Now, if, if, for any of you who've ever done computer vision, this is rather surprising, should be rather surprising. Why? Well, because um, doing a letter, even arbitrary rotated L with arbitrary rotated T, computationally sounds rather simple. Right? Essentially, you have to look for the alignment. Is the alignment like this or is it like this? This is a T and this is an L. Or, for example, something else you cannot do. You're unable to do this task. If this is green and this is red, telling this from, from this disk. So in other words, in the surround, somewhere I flash it, you know, you do the task here, in the surround I flash this task that's either this disk, that's either green, red or red, green. And you cannot tell which one is which. I mean, this is really computational. This is trivial, right? Anybody can write a computer program that distinguishes this from this. Yet your brain can, can do that. At the same time, your brain can't uh, take one of these images and decide whether there's an animal present in the image. And the animal can be a lion, can be an ant, can be a flock of bird, or can be a school of fish. Yes? No, 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 no. So the, the pictures, of course, are much la larger, but the, uh, the animals often are small. The animals inside, the, you know, sometimes they occupy this, sometimes the, the animal is a, is, a, is a small portion. But, but, but the relevant thing is, it's always, the, the, you normalize it always such that by itself, the performance is, uh, uh, by the task itself, is always roughly the same. So you just see the size and everything, so L versus T, so by itself, you do 85%. And the, the, the animal, non animal so by itself is 85%. Well, what's, right? So, 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 so that the performance is always the same. It's just remarkable that some things you can do uh, um, independent of the central task and other things you cannot do. And what's more surprising, that by itself is not so remarkable. What's surprising and what we just don't understand, one of the many things we don't understand, is why should something that seems very simple, like red, green, green, red, seems you can't do without attention, but something to us is complicated as animal, non-animal. Right now, there's no algorithm, there's no machine algorithm that can tell an arbit a picture whether that picture contains any animal or not. There's no algorithm like that around. I mean, in the people will make it, but right now they just don't exist. So, so that's, uh, we, we, we don't really understand it, uh, but there it is. So, so there the, the, impo the important point is that certain things we can do and certain things we can't do, and we have to look for an explanation for that. And the explanation will have to involve competition among receptive field, competition among neurons. And I'll talk a little bit about it next week. What, what, uh, what Leila, who's, a, who's your TA, what Leila showed just recently together with, uh, with Patrick Wilkin here is that you can also do even more demanding tasks. You can tell if I take a face, I remove all the facial, uh, facial hair, and then I ask you, is it a girl or boy? Male, female, gender discrimination. And again, that, if you look at the faces, they look very, they look, you know, you really have to look close. I mean, to me, it looks, you, you really have to look closely to tell, you know, because they wear no makeup, no glasses, no hair. Whether, so you just have to look at the, the fa their facial structure to tell whether it's a woman and a man. Yet again, you can do that without attention. Probably what it says is that those things that are, I mean, one way to read this is to say, well, those things that are of ecological relevance, those things are really important for at least when we evolve, like seeing whether there's an animal there, obviously gender discrimination is crucial for us. Uh, uh, those things are, um, you can somehow do it without attention, but those things like L versus T is a rather unnatural task. You have to do this very fine face discrimination. Um, that requires attention. Of course, that's not a mechanistic, that's not a neuronal explanation, that's a high-level functional explanation. Yes? Oh, don't look, don't look. Oh, don't look. <laughs> Sorry, covering this doesn't really help a lot. <laughs> It's an excellent question. Um, I know we discussed this. 
uh, I don't think that's an excellent point. Because, um, yeah, uh, no, it hasn't been done yet. I think we're supposed to do that, but uh, no, we haven't done it yet. No, that's an excellent question. Where you have both the same. So people have done other experiments like that where they have the same task in the center and the surround, and uh, sometimes you do get interference and sometimes not. So I'm not, I don't think it'll change, um, it'll change significantly because we know, we, we, we know um, that's why it comes back. We talked about it, but we haven't done it, but we really should because the question comes up often. I don't think it'll make a difference, but it's, it, it should be done as control. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. So that's why I, I don't think it'll make a difference whether you have a car, uh, let's say, an uh, image, a picture with an animal at the center and the same task in the surround, I think it can still be done. But, you know, that's the nature of science. We should do it. Maybe we're going to be in for a big surprise. And we haven't done that for faces either yet, right? Yeah. It would be a nice control. Good question. Any other question? Okay, so this is um, one case I wanted to discuss, and I'm, I'm somewhat confused about this topic, and I'm just, I think it just reflects, well, my confusion, and also the lack of detailed neuroscientific understanding of what attention is and what consciousness is. So as I said, many people, most psychologists, uh, would identify when you attend to something, you are conscious of, and when you're conscious of, of course you have to attend to it. But uh, certainly, if you use this operational definition of top-down attention, the one I showed you in this dual task, you can show that you can attend to certain things outside and other things you cannot, you, you, um, you, you cannot um, detect. So, and the fact that we don't perceive the world as a tunnel at least tells me that this, even the absence of focal or the near absence of focal attention, uh, you can still see things outside. On the other hand, those experiments in inattentional blindness and those gorilla in, the, in our midst experiment seems to tell us that we have no expectation whatsoever. Right? I mean, this is a compelling thing about this gorilla in the midst story. If we have no expectation forever, uh, uh, if we have no expectation whatsoever, and if we really attend, at least some of us, are blind to uh, very large, long-lasting signals in the image. I mean, the gorilla you know, took like five or ten seconds to walk across, and, and so it's, it's not just a very brief input, yet we totally miss it. Um, so I'm, I, I, uh, I'm, I don't know right now what, what to say about the relationship among, among consciousness and attention. In principle, I would say they're different, but maybe with, it is, you know, you could argue without this expectation at least, you don't see things. Um, now there's, um, there's another instance of a phenomenon called gist perception. This is another instance where you can argue that you don't have attention really, yet you still see it. Or you can withdraw attention and you can still see the gist. Or even inattentional blindness, so when, when it's totally unexpected, when I ask you to do this, remember this experiment where you have to judge is the horizontal or the vertical arm longer, and I totally unexpectedly flash up a single picture of a scene very quickly, you're very good at getting what's called the gist. So the gist is a high-level description, right? The gist of this is it's an office scene, you know, it's a lecture hall with people. That's gist. Knowing who, they, who it is or how many women and how many men and, you know, the color of your clothing, all of that, that's not gist anymore. It's not tell precisely, I mean, it's difficult to really define it precisely, but gist is a high-level semantic description of a scene, like mountain scene with people, you know, river with dog, you know, that sort of gist. So to demonstrate this, Faith made this... Um, This was one frame. Now, again, I don't really control it. So in principle, it's, I don't know, one frame. What's this? Uh, well, I don't know, that's 30, what's the clock of the LCD? Yeah, but the LCD isn't 60 hertz, or is it? Whatever. So it's a bit unclear what the exact timing here is. Did you see it? No? Yes? Was it Elvis? What was it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. We can look at it again. Yeah. So, um, so here, and you can do it. People have done experiments on this. You can show it very, very briefly, and you, and you still see something. In fact, some uh, movie makers have played around with it. There's a famous um, episode in one of the Woody Allen films where he kicks, in one of his very early films, where he kicks a can, and then he has this very brief uh, fl flashback. And so movie makers experimented already a long time ago at their frame rate, which usually is 24 hertz. How many frames do you need in order to induce a particular feeling in, in, in your audience? And they discovered that you actually can be very, very brief. People have made these, um, have made these uh, movies 
where they show you, for example, images at 10 hertz, so they show you different, you know, like MTV, except even faster than MTV. So you will have, let's say, 100 images, and each image is only on there for a 15th of a second. So you have 15 images uh, per, per second. And these are, let's say, line drawings. So each image by itself is a single line drawing of a tree, you know, a bicycle, a baby, a truck, whatever. And they come, you know, 100 of these at you at this 15 hertz rate. You can perfectly well see each one of them. It's quite remarkable. You might not remember them, of course, for the most part you won't, but that's different, we'll talk about that later, but you can certainly see them. So, so, so um, uh, A, that tells us our visual system is very fast, which is very surprising if we look at computer algorithms, because computer algorithms are very, the today existing machine vision algorithms are very slow on very fast machines, or the performance is, is, is still not nearly as good as our performance, and of course they operate on machines that, you know, it's, it's now gigahertz, well, you know, the, the sort of the clock speed, if you want to use that metaphor, it's not a very good one, but, you know, the switching speeds of neurons is on the order of a few milliseconds, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six milliseconds. Action potential is a millisecond across, a synaptic transmission takes half a millisecond or something like that, yet we can perceive things in 150 milliseconds. So, you know, you don't have a lot of, you don't have a lot of time to do processing. So, there's an interesting difference, a huge discrepancy in performance between us and, 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 and machines. And here the, here the claim is that you can do this just perception without really requiring attention, only minimal attention resources. So A, the, the, you have to explain what are the neuronal representations that support this, and um, B, that you can at least be conscious of something. And there, there's this phenomenon that people really don't study it all in the lab. Um, I, could call, I call it like spaced out phenomena, and we do, I mean, humans do this all the time. Is there, I don't know, is there a technical term for that? Uh, you know, you know, you can, for example, when you drive, I love, you know, I go climbing, you know, I drive, so I drive a lot to Red Rocks, so Yosemite, you're on the road there, you know, you're dreaming, and sort of there isn't too, many, uh, too much other traffic on the road, you can sort of, you know, you can do all sorts of things in your head while you're doing that, yet, and so you, this is what I call by space out, or when you're just sort of war ambling through the world, thinking of something else, but we do that all the time, um, and you, 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 you don't really, you attend to something that in your head, right, you imagine some conversation or replay some conversation, yet you still, it's not that you have no idea what's out there, right, clearly, you know, you can drive, you can make meaningful decisions whether to cross the road or not, um, and we'll talk about that separate, that sort of instance of these zombie systems, but I claim you still always have access to the, to the gist, you know roughly where you are, you know, you know, if you drive, there's an overpass coming up, there's a truck ahead of you, you know, you have to pull over, all of that's still going on. And so I think sort of this spaced out phenomenon relies partly on, on, on just perception. It has not been studied really in the lab as far as I know. Okay, so the conclusion, focal attention necessary, necessary for conscious vision. The classical answer is yes. This is almost by definition. Uh, certainly with focal attention tied down, somewhere in the image you can still see things, certain things. Um, for gist or familiar and isolated. So the claim is, or my claim is either for gist or for things that are very isolated or very familiar. So if, if there's a scene and there's nothing in that scene but sort of that car, you know, a single cause, then I, again, you don't need, you know, a single object, a single face or anything. Again, I don't see any need why you, would, why you need attention. Now this debate um, between the relationship between consciousness and, and attention, which, which I right now would probably say, well, they they often co-occur, very often in life they occur together, but they are actually separate mechanisms or separate processes. This debate cannot really be resolved right now. We really need to go to the underlying neural mechanisms to understand both consciousness and attention, and then sort of to be able to understand under what conditions are they very similar. You know, is it just pipeline? First you need to attend, and then once, you know, you attend, like in a pipeline architecture, you're conscious of, or do they, so they, are they different? I mean, what's the exact relationship between the two? Psychological methods by themselves are, in general, just not powerful enough to be able to answer this. Okay, the last point I wanted to make about um, um, attention is, a, is a, I wanted to allude to a problem that's very often discussed when attention and when consciousness comes up. And it's a problem that's inherent in certain types of architecture, of computational architectures. It's called the binding problem. Binding. It comes out of the brain's architecture. Um, and the problem is the following. And it exists in two different versions. So in one version is, let's say you attend to my face. Okay, let's say only my face is present. Forget everything else in the, in the world. Well, we know um, 
that let's see you there is a high re resolution image of my of my head if you're looking let's say you're looking at my nose of my face on v1 in your primary visual cortex if i move as i do constantly that's going to activate neurons in mt you have i have certain color you know color hair and uh, color cues of my skin that's going to activate some other neurons my voice will activate neurons in in vernicus area in the speech areas you know something who i am or you know i well, what i say makes sense to you so that sort of activates other parts of your brain Yet if you're looking at me, so the problem is a single complex percept like, like my face, talking, moving, will evoke all sorts of activities in very different parts of your brain. Yet your percept is not of that nature. Your percept is a unitary percept, right? In general, unless maybe you're schizophrenic or something. You, you, you're looking at me, the voice comes out of my mouth, everything is put together, right? The shoe isn't over here when I move. It's not like sort of the, the color that gets dragged, but the shoe is on my face, the voice comes from my mouth, and my head moves. It's not, motion isn't attached to something else. It all fits together. And how can this, how can this occur in this architecture when you have these widely distributed parallel networks? This is known as the, um, uh, this is known as the binding problem. Now, it gets even more complicated when you have two objects or multiple objects. So let's say you have a scene. Okay, let me, let me just put that in your short-term memory. They're, they're, uh, and the binding problem has been looked at both from a point of view of AI or, or computer vision or neural networks, as well as from a, so from a computational perspective, as well as it also been looked at from a perceptual perspective. And this is, again, Anne Triesmann, the psychologist who sort of pioneered some of these um, feature integration theory and visual search paradigm. So the, her claim is that, um, okay, so she uses this language that I don't like at all. She uses this high-level psychological language. She talks about object files and things like that. I, I, I don't like that because I don't know where, I, I, uh, I think it's a very bad metaphor and it's a misleading metaphor and I, I don't know really what objects files are and where they exist in the brain. But the, but, 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 but the problem is, um, but she says, you, the, here the claim is, in order to correctly attribute um, different, uh, so the idea is you have different feature maps, your feature maps for color, for orientation, for, uh, for texture, for emotion, etc. And in order to combine them, you need attention. So that attention solves the binding problem. Attention would somehow select out the relevant objects in the color map, in the, in the motion, among the motion neurons, among the depth neurons, the texture neurons, will all bind them together. That if you have very simple, uh, very simple uh, features or po uh, objects like just a single bar that has essentially only orientation and location, you don't need attention. In particular, if you have neurons that are already ha that are coded already sort of genetically to represent those things. And we know, for example, a simple cell in V1 will represent the location of a of an elongated object with a certain orientation. So this cell, sort of in hardware, solves already the the binding problem for location and for orientation. But if you if you want to do things that you that you didn't you know that your brain didn't uh, wire up a particular neuron like if I show you some of those search tasks where you have to combine color and orientation for instance uh, well then you I mean then you need selective attention and so then now let me come back to the second more difficult version of the of the uh, binding problem so okay these are two different colors so let's see what happens if you have um, let's see you can have an L or a T, and the L can be either brown and the T. Okay, so here now I have four, I have you know, two, uh, two dimensions, letter, which can be L, T, and I have two colors. So now if the brain, so now let's say there's a scene that has this. Okay, now in a topographic network, if I, if I map this now into a network that's sort of topographic, right? So here I have sort of maps one map for, for, for color and one map, let's say, for, for letters, as it were. Well, then, over you know, in this color map, I'll get activity here corresponding to this, and I'll get activity here corresponding to that. In the letter map, I get it for here and for here. And, you know, this activity can activate, let's say, black neurons. I mean, this is all very abstract. And this activity over here activates brown neurons, and so then I can match the color activity here with the letter activity, and I can say, oh, it's a, it's a black L and it's a brown T. However, if, I, if there are maps in the brain, like they are in these high-level visual areas, like for example in the object recognition in the object area IT, sort of at the endpoint of the of the dorsal um, object perception, uh, the what pathway, there's very little there's some, but there's very little receptive um, field organization left. There's very little topography left. That's early on in the brain, but 
uh, you know, as we mentioned, the receptor field becomes larger and larger, and topography sort of di slowly disappears. It's not abruptly, but it slowly disappears, and there's very little of it is present in these high-level visual areas. Then I have the problem, how do I, how do I keep, um, either I wire up individual neurons that, you know, a neuron that will only respond to a black T, and I have another neuron, or a set of neurons that only responds to brown T, and a third one for, red, for what is it, a black T, and a fourth one for a black L. Or I have, an, uh, I have uh, because otherwise I have this problem, right? If a neuron is active, how do I know, uh, how do I know it was a, bl a, black, a black L versus knowing it's a black T, right? If I separate somewhere represent color, so over, uh, all I say, no, it's black, and, you know, uh, brown, and L and T, how do I know this goes with this and this goes with this, rather than the black goes with the T and the brown goes with the L? So this is sort of the more difficult version of the of the um, the more difficult version of the binding problem. When you have two or more objects, how do I keep the properties separate? How do I assign that one set of properties to one object and another set of properties to another object? And she pred and she had these ideas because sometimes she discovered people make so-called um, conjunctive errors. But if I flash, it seems very quickly, you know, these, uh, remember the, she did these experiments where you flash, let's say, L's and T's and horizontal and vertical or various letters of various colors. Sometimes people would make errors, but if she analyzed the pattern of the errors, there were more than expected, <coughs> more than by expected by chance, these, sorry, illusional conjunction. There were these uh, illusional conjunction errors. So here, for example, the claim is that when I flash you lots of arrays with L's and T's, that sometimes you would say, oh, there was, I saw a, a, brown, a, a brown T, or I saw a black L. Uh, the idea is that people combine this. I think this is true, but I think it occurs, I mean, as far as I can tell from the literature, and certainly it, it's not very common in life. I mean, yes, there's sort of occasionally these episodes, you know, when you have a, um, you, you know, this, this, sort of the story here, the, the girl wearing the red pants and green tea and, and, you know, maybe you could say, oh, she actually, you know, had a, had a green pants and, and red t-shirt. Um, but I, I mean, I, so these, um, these um, illusion conjunctions certainly exist. I don't think they're all that common. But they could reflect the fact that if the system is severely limited, if I show you these images only for very briefly, then you don't have enough computational, you know, you don't have enough time for the networks to settle down into their steady state, as it were, and signal correctly things, and sometimes they can make these illusionary errors. Um, yes, and this is essentially, it's due, um, the computational version of the uh, problem, as I just talked about it in these maps, essentially due to this German physicist, Christopher von Malzburg, who's a professor at USC, uh, half, half, half the time and half the time he's a professor in Germany, and he talked about long time ago, in 1981, in the very well-known paper, he talked that the brain somehow has to solve this binding problem. That the binding problem is a big problem in these non-topographic networks um, when you want to represent multiple attributes and you don't do it without hardwiring. You know, for every possible percept, you have a group of neurons, then this problem doesn't occur. But the argument is that computational is very expensive. You need to have lots and lots of neurons for every possible combination of every possible object and the brain surely can't do that, and therefore it has to solve this problem in some other way. And then the claim was that these oscillations that I briefly mentioned early on, these are synchronized oscillations, that the brain could do this by using temporal information. That yes, you have different maps that code for color, and you have another map that codes for letters or orientation, but the things that go together, they fire together. So essentially you have the group over here that codes for L, and the thing over here that codes for brown, they sort of fire together, they, they're synchronized, they're discharges. And that, this fact that they fire together, rather than the other neurons sort of fire independently, that is the critical code, the critical piece of information that tells the postsynaptic networks, the neurons that look at, the, the network that looks at that, saying, okay, these objects uh, go together because they fire together, and therefore I'm going to perceptually combine them into this unitary percept. Now, the binding problem is well known. It's still very controversial whether, in fact, it really exists, in the sense that you could argue, well, you have really two mechanisms. You have a very sloppy mechanism because um, you, you have a very sloppy mechanism for those things that I really haven't seen before. And I code them in, again, in, in, in neurons, but I don't co co code them very precisely. 
And if for, for all those things, for all those objects, for all my friends, all my enemies, I, I don't think I have any, but for all, you know, for everything I've, I've seen and grow up and see every day, the font of my computer, my dogs, my, you know, my dress, my, you know, the people that are around me, all of those actually are code with individual, with groups of neurons. And if you think about it, and if you do sort of crude back of the envelope uh, estimation, there aren't really that many discrete objects, you know, or, or different type of people, or faces, etc. In, in my environment, you know, call it 10 to the three, call it 10 to the four. Um, you know, if you code if you code each one of them by a couple of dozen neurons, and you remember there are 100,000 100, neurons per, per per cubic millimeter of cortex, um, and you know you have uh, on the order of 1,200 square centimeter cortical tissue, these numbers are re not really that big. So um, uh, conceptually, the problem is well known as the spinning problem. That's why I think it's important to talk about it. To what extent it's a real problem for the brain remains controversial. Certainly, there are cases like these illusional conjunctions when you incorrectly combine things, not randomly, but in this interesting way where you combine uh, you know, attributes of different objects and, and, and swap them out. So certainly, under some condition, it, it is. But that also suggests the fact that these illusional conjunctions are not that often. Um, you know, it's not that often that you compute, you know, that you can confuse, let's say, you know, when somebody's walking the dog, that you can confuse the color of the dog with the color of the person, right? You know, or the, you know, when there's a person walking in the car next nearby, how often do you confuse the color of the car with the color of the person? That those things don't really occur very often in normal life suggests that maybe the problem, it's less of a problem than we think it is. Okay, that was finished off. Are there questions about binding problem or attention? No, it's all clear. No, I mean I don't see how. Um, you know, I mean I can tell. You know, once I have access to your body, I can then maybe read off you know, skin conductance, things like that, but uh, just by looking at you, no. No, I mean, that's why it's also called covert shifts, you know, I mentioned the over shifts of attention, um, eye movements and covert shifts of attention, and those you can't see from the outside. So it's, it's much more difficult to study them. That's why you need to use these indirect techniques when they really force you to pay attention there, uh, otherwise you don't do the task, and you need to use these indirect techniques to make sure you're actually attending. No, because you can look at me and be a million miles away, and of course we all know that happens. But not in this lecture. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about related problem, uh, which is that time and consciousness. So um, there's a huge and deep literature going back to the middle of the 19th century, at least, if not earlier. That, that ask questions about the evolution of conscious perception or the evolution of, of, um, of, of, um, of perception, particularly in the visual domain again. So there's an early experiment. This was done, I think, in 1895 in Paris. At least it's published in J. Physiol de Paris, um, where they did the following experiment. So they asked, they had a single light, incandescent light, and um, there was a, a standard um, there was a standard reference light that was on all the time and there was a little light and that was on for various for various uh, time and the the subject was asked to compare the impression of of that of the transient light uh, for um, you know when it was very briefly on when it was longer on compared always to the uh, to the constant reference light and then you get a curve like this so in other words the idea is that for short times you know it's it's an, a not bright compare. It's less bright than this reference light. Then it's in fact more brighter than the reference light until, for longer time, sort of it's identical to the reference light. Obviously, if if there's the, the the flashlight is on as long as the reference light, you're going to get the same answer. Now, often this has often been misinterpreted. So this would suggest, if you just look at this, and it has often been interpreted in this way, which is erroneous, as I'll tell you in a second, that actually that the perception at short time scale changes continuously. In other words, here, the, the interpretation is that if I look at a light, first it's very weak, then it's f brighter, brighter, and then sort of it settles down to its steady state. That is not the case. This, as far as I know, and I, I would dearly love to know otherwise, for short times, perception appears to be all or none. And what happens here is that 
would, you have to read this in a different sense. You have to read this in a sense that if I flash a light this long, if it's on for whatever this time is, x, then you see it as uh, for this amount of time. If I flash it on for this time, you see it uh, that bright. If I flash it on for this amount of time, it's quite bright. And if I flash it on this amount of time, it's, uh, it's sort of as bright as a reference light. It, this, is the, this does not imply that the light becomes sort of changes in time. As far as we can tell, um, I think it's a very important point because it tells you something about the underlying neuronal mechanisms, the, un the dynamics of the underlying neural networks. As far as we can tell, certainly for short times, things don't, uh, you don't see a change in the individual percept. They don't blend into one another. There's another experiment by Efron where he did, um, he flashed on for 20 milliseconds a red light. So if you look at it in, in time, so 20 milliseconds, uh, 40 milliseconds. So here there was a red light and then there was a green light. Um, now, what you see is sort of uh, some sort of yellowish, which probably has slightly greenish hinge. You don't, you don't ever see in these conditions, for the short times, you don't see a red light that then go, turns into a green light. Now, if I do it for long times, then of course you do see it. If I leave it on for a second red light and then a second green light, then you will see some sort of, uh, some sort of transition. But for short times, the point is that the way we perceive that things are, that there's some sort of, there's some sort of, um, um, mixing that the, the um, that you know you get some sort of you know mix of red and green which is some sort of yellow but you don't get but, but the percept is constant so that this stimulus gives rise to constant percept not to an evolving percept and I think that's terribly important um, hmm. because it does suggest it does suggest this sort of model for the, for, now, and, and this is pure speculation, but this does suggest this sort of model for the origin of the neural collet of consciousness, let's say for these simple stimuli, that you have to go above threshold, and then once you're above, that you have some neural mechanism that explicitly codes for the phenomenal visibility. In other words, for the fact that I see it, I have this sensation. I can not only push a button and indicate how long or how bright it is, but I actually see it. And that, that seeing has to have a neurophysiological correlate. And that correlates, let's say, some sort of process that goes above threshold, probably that requires feedback. I'll tell you why in a second. And uh, the question is, to what extent do any further perturbation of, of let's, say this is a let's say this is a group of neurons that fires. So well, what is it that you actually perceive? What is it that the, 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 the corresponds to the qualia, to the, to the sensation of seeing the stimulus? Is it just the fact that you're above threshold for certain times, or is it actually the time, the detailed time cost of this? It's a question we just don't know right now. Now, there's likely to be hysteresis in a sense. These are physical, uh, uh, very complicated systems. So it's very unclear. So it's probably not the case that this threshold and this threshold are the same. There might be feedback, for example, excitatory feedback that sort of, um, uh, where, where you get hysteresis-like phenomena, like in uh, ferromagnetism in, in, in physics. Now, this also, this is an idea by, by Samuel Zeki, who has some evidence to back it up. This also suggests that there might be, for different aspects of consciousness, who says, I mean, it's a question that really has never been investigated until the last decade or so, who says that all of our conscious perception have to occur at the same time? Who says that the conscious perception for red has to occur at the same time as the conscious perception for the brightness or for the location of the stimuli, right? When I look at a color stimuli, I see everything at once. It see the color comes on, I see the color, I can tell you it's red, it's very bright, and it's at, you know, it's just a little bit to the left of my computer. But who's to say that if I look at the detail time scale that, that they all occur at the same time? In fact, it might well be that if I look at the underlying neuronal processes, that they occur at different times. Right? We talked about the fact that the different neural subcomponents have different uh, propagation velocities. Remember, we talked about the Magno and the Pavo cellular pathway. The Magno uh, cellular pathway originates in the retina and goes to primary visual cortex. That seems to encode rapidly moving objects. The Pavo cellular pathway it seems to encode objects with high spatial precision and seems to encode color. Well, they have different propagation velocities, and so therefore they might reach, you know, do whatever they do, go above threshold or whatever at different times. And there is some evidence, it's, it remains controversial by Seymour Zeki, uh, it remains cont uh, somewhat controversial, um, but there is evidence that it is the case if you actually look at the detailed microstructure of perceptual phenomena, that there are actually these discrepancies on the order of, 30, 40, up to 80 milliseconds between different aspects of, 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 um, 
of different attributes of objects, like color and motion. Uh, so he coined this very nice term, micro-consciousness. And so his idea is, well, you have a micro-consciousness for color, and you have micro-consciousness for orientation, and for, for texture, and for stereo. So if each attribute has its own, has its own consciousness, that's really just, uh, I mean, just looking at it, and in terms of NCCs, you have different NCC. Each conscious aspect that you see, each attribute has its own NCC. So you have an NCC for color and for motion, and they don't necessarily, in fact, it's probably very unlikely that they all go above threshold at the same time and they all go below threshold at the same time. Then, of course, you can ask the question, well, if that's really the case, that seems like a pretty messy system, why don't I see that? Why don't I see these things? For example, if I move rapidly, you know, ima you know, imagine, let's say, last summer I had gorgeous red hair. I got my hair dyed. I'm going to do it again this summer. I had my hair dyed this bright orange, and um, I have a picture I can show you, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so imagine I rapidly move my, my, uh, in my hair. Now imagine there's actually a difference, as Zaki claims, of 80 milliseconds between color and motion. Well, shouldn't that then imply that actually if I move very quickly, that you see the motion, but the color actually, you see the color only some time later? Right, you know, like in some of those televideo conferencing, right, if you move very quickly, you know, it takes time to, to shift. Yet, yet we don't really, we've never seen that. I mean, certainly in your own life, this ne never really happens. But now, so it's, a, it's an excellent question. And um, one answer could be, well, if, it is, if the delays are small, you would only notice them if there's an explicit process in your head that calls for those things. And that's really a very important take-home message, no matter what the neural correlate of conscience is, that what, you can only be conscious of those things if you have an an explicit representation somewhere in the head that codes for them. If, if there's no such explicit representation, you're not going to be conscious of it. And because there is no homunculus, we have to get rid of the homunculus. There is no homunculus. So it's not that like, you know, it's not like, of course, if I'm gone, I look down at my brain, and I can see, oh, there is the, uh, the, uh, the NCC for color, and there's the NCC for motion, and they seem to be delayed for 80 milliseconds. Okay, but if there is no such, uh, if there is no such entities, uh, uh, no such neural network that explicitly does that computation, then I'll miss it unless it, ex you know, unless it occurs at such big time scales where I can notice, where I can notice it. So that would be one explanation why if these differences exist, they might actually not be, um, you wouldn't notice them unless you did, you know, fancy scientific experiments. Similar things to the blind spot, right? We don't, you know, they, at, at the location of the retina, there is no information, but we don't have an explicit representation for that. In fact, our brain goes to great, ex, uh, goes to great pains to compensate for that lack of, of representation at that, at that location, and, you know, it tries to fill in. Um, yeah. For short times, yes. Oh, yeah, for short times. Wait, 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 say that again? You mean when it's so bright it goes through your eyelids? Exactly. I, I don't... Well, well, okay, so an after image... Yeah, an after image, it becomes... Uh, it, uh, of course, it fades gradually, but that takes... Uh, that, that takes uh, t um, plays over long time scales, over I mean, many seconds. When I short, talk about short times, I'm talking about tens of milliseconds, very short times. And over those short of times, you don't see something that changes. Uh, for example, if I do this experiment with 20 milliseconds, you don't see a red light followed by green light. You just see a single light of, um, of, um, of somewhat yellow. This raises a question that people are testing. It's called um, chromatic color fusion. So let's say I take a grating and I modulate it, red, green, red, green, red, green, do it faster and faster and faster. At some point, that's called the flicker fusion frequency for color. It's like 12 hertz. I'm unable, uh, I'm unable to follow the individual periods. I don't see it as, so if I do it slowly, let's say half a second red, half a second green, half a second red, I can clearly see red, green. If I do it at 10 hertz or 12 hertz, I don't see the individual colors anymore. I just see, I see it uh, yellow, I smear it out yellow. And how yellow it is depends on, you know, the exact setting of the red and green. Yeah, I just mentioned that, that, that that's this experiment. Here, there's, a, there's, an, there's a, a, another question I can ask about the brain. Can I tell, for example, this from this? This stimulus from this stimulus? Green, red. And people have done a lot of these temporal uh, simultaneity or, or temporal order uh, judgments. 
Uh, now, I, in this case, I can because what happens if I so randomly I give you either this stimulus or this stimulus and I ask you which comes first. Now here, what you do, you translate this temple order judgment into color judgment because this you're going to see a little bit more greenish and this is going to look a little bit more reddish. The time runs from left to right here as usual, and so. This, the red has a little bit more impact on your perception than the green because the green has already decayed a little bit here. Therefore, this looks a little bit more reddish and this looks a little bit more greenish. So under this condition, I can, I can, um, I can tell um, the, objects, uh, the objects apart. Uh, I don't know. Efren would have done that. Then you put... Then, okay, so then you have to, so in other words, you're asking, let me see, if I make this a little bit shorter and this a little bit shorter, right? So they actually look the same. Well, then, uh, okay, so then the claim is, my strong claim is you would not be able to tell it apart. So te when they do temple order judgments, so there are two ways you can do temple order. You can either use the more general mechanisms, and the, which you have to use here. So here, if you equilibrate out the it's a good idea. If you equilibrate out the color, you're not going to see the difference. You will see the difference once it's more than 50 or 60 or 80 milliseconds. In other words, if you have 100 milliseconds red, 100 milliseconds green, that you can tell from 100 milliseconds green, 100 milliseconds red. But unless you, for example, if I give you two tones, we've done this a lot with tones. Now, um, of course, if I, give you, if I give you two tones and they have very short time interval between them, then I hear them inside my head and I can hear more, you know, if the right ear leads, you know, if this leads by one millisecond over the left ear, then I hear the tone inside my head, I hear it sort of on the right side, it's a phase shift, and when this one leads a little bit, I hear it over here, so that's one way I can tell, I can tell very short times using, using, um, using auditory cues. Or, for example, in the, if I just flash two lights and I ask you which light comes first, if I put them next to each other, I have a flash light here five milliseconds, then this light here five milliseconds. If I put them close to each other, you can tell because that translates into motion. But if this is first and this, you see them moving like this or the other way. If I avoid that, if I put them for some great distance, then you're not able to do that anymore. There's another uh, uh, experiment here that was done in the 60s where they had sort of... Um, I guess this must have been done on an oscilloscope because they didn't have, uh, you know, XY bitmap monitors at the time. Well, they had a ball sort of, you know, approach one ball, uh, approach, you know, one ball which is stationary, and then the, after a while the second ball moved. And they asked, what do people see? And if the time between, you know, it hits the first ball and the second ball moves, if it's less than, so here you see the, the first, uh, this curve here, if it's less than sort of 80 milliseconds or something, certainly if it's less than 70 milliseconds, you, people perceive it as causality, that the first ball push, you know, like billiard balls, it, it, you know, translates its impulse to the other ball and the ball moves. If it's longer than, you know, 100 or 140 milliseconds, you just see it as two totally separate events. And if it's somewhere in between, you see it like it, it hits it, and then it stores energy, and then it begins to move. So there are a lot of experiments like this, temple uh, simultaneity, apparent simultaneity, that leads you to, to the conclusion is, yes, there are all sorts of specialized processes in the brain that allow, us to, that allow me, or uh, animals, to tell time. And I can do, uh, particularly in the auditory domain, uh, for, so for example, we can do auditory localization. This is a mar work of Marco Nishi here. Barnhouse can do this exceedingly well to the resolution of one degree. Uh, and I do it by comparing temporal cues. So I can certainly do that, and the, the claim has been I can do that. Ultimately, my hardware has to distinguish the, um, spikes at the, at the microsecond level. But, but that's a very special purpose process. And in general, when I don't have such, or for example, I can use color here, hue. When I don't have this general, pro when I don't have this specific process, I'm thrown back in a general process, and this general process has a crude resolution of 50 to 100 milliseconds. And the claim of one set of people is, and there are theories of that that goes back to the 19th century. It's never really been proven satisfactory. Is that sort of you have these uh, that um, that uh, things that occur within 50, 60, 80, 100 milliseconds. This interval might vary a great deal on the modality, on the type of stimulus, whether you attend, etc. But that if, if things come within an interval, you're unable to perceive, you're unable to see them as separate. You will see things as simultaneously if if they occur within one interval. And one conclusion there has been, which is, remains very controversial, that at some level the brain sort of is this, I don't want to say clock system because it's not a computer clock, but the brain is some sort of system where you don't have a continuous evolution, 
uh, of percepts, but, but where percepts sort of are in discrete chunks, and you see something for short times, and then you see it differently. So it would be a little bit like a movie, where each individual clip isn't a fixed time like in a, in a movie, but can actually can be variable. There all of the, I mean, there are lots of theories like that around, that remains very controversial. Partly because it's very difficult to test that at, uh, at the physiological level. I don't know. I'm sure there are, you know, if you have a motion lesion, you'll probably have a lesion in your ability to, to see fine mo motion. I, I've never heard of a, of a patient who has a generalized lesion that, and I wouldn't expect that because, you know, each of your different modalities, you know, this process is a very different one that you use for doing motion, which is a different one that you would use here, right? And then, of course, we have separate mechanism for doing temporal duration that people are now beginning to study, and there's some interesting illusions there, right? So there's probably a whole bunch of separate mechanisms that uh, they occur at different time scale. You know, if you close your eyes, say, you know, tell me when a second has passed, or tell me when a minute has passed, and people can do that reasonably well, and they make, sometimes they make mistakes, they make, inter, you know, there's a certain pattern of mistakes. So there are other mechanisms, there's sort of, um, you know, clock-like mechanisms that people use that regulates uh, the, the perception of temporal passage. But once the, the, the model here, like so often in biology, is that these are all separate discrete processes. While you might think, well, okay, it's all in a computer, it's all done, you have a central clock, and everything is always referred to that central clock. It's very different in the brain where you have very separate, totally separate mechanisms that do all of these things. Uh, independently, sometimes, you know, in cooperation, uh, sometimes you can have discrepancy between the two. This is, let me, I'm trying to remember the, the experiment here. This is an experiment also by Efron. So Efron was this guy at, um, was, uh, he still is, I think, at the, um, in Northern California. He does a lot of experiments relating to timing. And here he was arguing that there's a minimal perceptual duration, uh, sorry, minimal perceptual mo moment. This is, it's a minimal perceptual mo moment, not motion. Sorry. That and he did that by 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 manipulating uh, two lights, the on and off. It's a very tricky experiment. He manipulated the on and off set of light beams and says, and again argues that that perceptually um, there is a there is a, um, a minimal moment. So this well, what this plot says is the relationship between the physical duration that the stimulus is on, let's say on the retina, and the perceptual duration how long you perceive it on. And the argument is that even a very brief stimulus, even a very brief stimulus, that's an impulse response, you know, think of it in terms of physics. You have, an, you have a physic, you have a system, you kick it, you put in a delta function, you get an, you know, you get an impulse response function out. Well, this is obviously a very nonlinear system, and you have one of the properties, you have this highly, uh, high, this, uh, this nonlinearity, in the sense that even very brief stimuli give rise to a, uh, to a minimal duration, and for this time, really, you know, all these, all these different durations will give to stimuli that you cannot tell apart directly. Now, you might be able to tell it indirectly by, by brightness, for instance. So the claim is that if you just see how long the duration of a stimulus is, that whether it's this long or this long or this long, it always gives rise to the same perceptual duration. Now, of course, if I ask people to alternate a first, first choice, did I present the stimulus whether this long or this long, that people can do because of a, a phenomenon called Bloch's law, Essentially, if I leave on the stimulus twice as long, you've got twice as much signal energy, right? If you just look at the total number of photons, there are twice as many photons, and there, and for very short times, there's a direct linear trade-off between duration and energy. So, you, you know, I can make a stimulus twice as bright and half as uh, half as uh, uh, long, and um, you have the same you have the same percept as I do it um, twice as you know uh, twice as long for half the brightness. So. So again, one has to be aware, it's a very complicated system with different processes, and you really have to think hard what system are you querying when you're, when you're asking observers to, to do something. But here, based on these psychophysical experiments, the claim is that even for very short times, there's always a minimal duration. And then there's some sort of scaling, probably not entirely linear. It'll probably, it's probably going to have some non saturating nonlinearities in it. So again, this, tell, this I think is very interesting because it suggests something about the underlying dynamics, underlying uh, neural network dynamics that have to underlie these NCCs. Do you know what the 
Yeah, so here the stimulus time is 130 milliseconds and it was 220 milliseconds perceived time. But that might really depend totally on the stimulus. That really might depend on the stimulus. If you use a brighter stimulus, it might be shorter. Um, uh, I, I mean, I suspect he didn't do it for different, he did it for this one stimulus. Uh, but I suspect it, dep it will depend on the stimulus you use. Yes? Well, okay, so no, yes, it, it's a very good question. That's why these experiments are tricky. So he used two different stimuli, then ask at what point do they interfere with each other? And at what point you see one stimulus changing into another stimulus? So you cannot do it directly, because again, there's no, refer you know, there's no absolute reference signal. Of course, so you all, you know, it's a, the, the trouble is you have this very complicated system. You only can measure the output, what I say, or the buttons I push. So of course, there could be lots of transformation that go on between the, the NCC, let's say, in my visual brain, and the representation by the time I go to motor cortex or by the time I speak in Broca's area, right? There couldn't go, there'll be all sorts of further transformation that I don't really control because I, you know, I can't open up the box. So um, ultimately, so that's the, um, one of the limitations of all these methods, that if I just look at the output, um, it's very difficult to infer directly what's, what's inside the system. But Okay, now I'll give you the single most, I think, important evidence why a consciousness has to involve feedback. And this is a phenomenon called backward masking. So this is the same image uh, you just saw. It shows the street scene for one frame, whatever the frame is here, and then followed by what's called a mask. So in this case, a mask was, um, okay, so what you'll see these stimulus, and this is a very common term in psychophysics. You see an image, okay, you see some people here, and then I leave that on for some time, the ISI. This is part of your homework, incidentally. And then I flash on what's called a mask. And the mask sort of can be anything that sort of destroys. The idea is that I want to put on something on, on, the, on, on the retina that destroys, that destroys the image-relevant activity in the retina and in, in the rest of the brain. And so I want to use something that has lots of structures, but it's random structures. And so the result is there. This is, now here the stimulus was on for one frame, then the mask. The next uh, is the image is on for two, f two frames and then the mask. That you can, you can see a difference, right? And now it's on for one frame with no mask. Now that should have been the most visible of all, right? So we, so we can just do that once, once again. This is called backward masking. In the homework, there's also forward masking. So backward masking is, you know, time goes like this. First I have the stimulus, then I have the mask. I can also put the stimulus before. That's called forward masking. It's not as efficient. Let's just do that again. So here you have this single image and a mask. Difficult to see. After a while, by the way, this is also learning. After a while, it's certainly easier to see, right? Two frames and no mask. Now, if, if you imagine if the image is very bright, of course, you're going to see an after image. And then the image de facto, although I removed it within 20 milliseconds, if it's very bright, it might stay burned into your phosphor. You know, like if I do flash photography, right? You see the pattern burned into your eyes for many seconds, as, as, as um, Irma was, was, uh, was just asking. Um, so, so, um, so that's one function. That's why you want to use a mask, because a mask allows you to precisely control how long the, stimulus, the relevant stimulus is actually present on the retina. So if you mask it, then the stimulus will only be present for this amount of time, you know, between the onset of the stimulus and the onset of the mask. This time, this is called ISI, interstimulus interval. So you can precisely control how long it was present. Now, what does this imply? Think about it. What does it imply in terms of the architecture? If you have an image, and then up to, up to 80 to 100 milliseconds later, this image can still be rendered invisible uh, by, um, by a mask. Or it can still interfere with the perception of the mask. Now, it seems to me that this really implies you have to have some feedback pathway in order to be conscious. Right? Because if you just have a feed forward, just think you have a totally pipeline architecture, the total feed forward architecture. Right? So you have this series of boxes, you know, retina, LGN, V1, V4, IT, uh, you know, motor cortex, spinal cord, you push, the, you know, you push your fingers. 
And uh, sort of you always have these two images racing. First you have the activity corresponding to the image, and then 80 milliseconds later the activity corresponding to the mask. Well, if it's uh, just a feed-forward architecture, then there shouldn't be any, um, you know, there shouldn't be any interference. So the fact that up to 80 or 100 milliseconds after the image is removed from the retina, this, I can put on a second image that can interfere or erase it, really suggests to me very strongly that it's got to be feedback, that there has to be, the conscious must involve a feedback, so the activity here has to reside for a certain time as a feedback that happens, then some magic happens, as in the famous Yorka cartoon, and then you get bingo, you get conscious sensation. Is this better? Is this better? So the example you gave is not really illustrative of that because uh, we did see the first image, right? Even when the mask was on. So you could argue that it's just feed forward, but uh, it's immediately overtaken. Yeah, but yeah, yes, but, uh, but because in this case, this, the image was not the, the mask. Wa this is. No, absolutely. This is not part of a psychophysical experiment. <laughs> you are set to sleep. The fire alarm in this building has been activated. Please <laughs> operations immediately. Proceed to the nearest fire exit and leave the building. I just didn't want to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs>